appreciate the invitation to, uh, to be here and to talk to you about BGP. It's the thing that I've been studying for probably the last 15 years. Um, it is indeed the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of internet routing. It's a very simple protocol, and it's being used, as you said, by, by people who probably uh, were never anticipated to be participants in it at scales that we never would have imagined. So you do a very simple thing at unreasonably large scale, and what happens can be really mysterious. So rather than focus on maybe some of the technical minutia of the RFCs which you can go read, today I'm going to take you on a walk through some of the really interesting emergent phenomena that happen when you get tens of thousands of organizations to speak this little protocol that, that uh, originally was just spoken by a few people. So today, what I'd like to take you through is um, perhaps a statement of the core problem, if you're going to look at this as a research problem, which is one of attribution and belief. Uh, what is the ground truth of IP addressing on the internet? Is it ever true that an IP address equals a building, or a machine, or a person? We talk about attacks coming from IP addresses. And yet, if you look down at the fundamentals of how routing actually works, you realize that there is not as much certainty there as we'd hope. So we're going to walk through some examples of how BGP kind of works in cartoon form with some real participants and some real, uh, uh, some real language about how people actually connect. And then we'll take a tour of some of the terrible, terrible things that people do to each other uh, through using the BGP. So we're going to play a couple games, maybe spot some evil. Um, and we'll look at some of the worst things that are being done in the last few years down in the plumbing where nobody's paying attention. Um, if I just go to perhaps my background a little bit, it might help to explain how, how I got to, to this point. Um, I started my career in the 1990s doing high performance computing. And uh, at that point, DARPA was looking at the problems of building larger and larger scale machines. In the early 90s, uh, that kind of networking meant very, uh, very high speed networks that you'd put in a cabinet or in a building, right? They were building supercomputers um, that uh, were building scale at best. And it was around that time, as we get towards the middle of the 90s, that you know, if you've ever been working on a research agenda and you start getting a little voice in the back of your head that something else more interesting is happening, it started to happen to us. And it's, I think it started to happen to DARPA as well. Um, they realized that the internet was, was, had been in use, of course, for 20 years, but now the web had appeared. And it was causing a lot of new use cases and a lot of people to join, because it was the killer app, uh, that were causing dynamics that nobody really understood. And so in a very adroit move for a large research organization, DARPA decided to start funding research into how internet dynamics behaved. And we were there uh, looking at, um, initially we wanted to look at uh, how people might participate using the World Wide Web to do high performance computing. Right? You take small steps from where you are initially. Uh, I had the good fortune to work with some of the folks who were doing large integer uh, factorization projects. We had the, the number field sievers out there uh, working away on projects that could be broken up into pieces and distributed and the results posted back. So we built one of the, uh, the very early systems for uh, passing out work and recombining work, kind of an early forerunner of SETI at home. Uh, and this was in 1990, I want to say seven or eight. Um, and, and that was interesting, right? We suddenly realized that there were a lot more CPUs, there was a lot more memory accessible to us if we could get out there and bring everybody in on these projects than we could build even with the most lucratively funded single building project. Um, th the next step really from a funding perspective was to go look at simulation and modeling. So we said we're gonna have, uh, we were getting, uh, we were quoting things like tens of thousands of nodes participating on the internet. What would happen? And we wanted to review uh, what would happen if you changed parameters in TCP? What would happen if you modified BGP? Um, what sort of chaos could you model? And we started to build using our, our uh, high performance computing and parallelization expertise, some of the tools for understanding what internet looked like at those scales. Um, pretty soon, as we, we rounded the millennium, we were looking at doing larger and larger simulations of the internet. And we developed these enormous data sets for what had happened. And we realized we had no visualization, we had no analytics, uh, we were going to have to build the tool chain in order to figure out what had happened in the experiment. It was no longer the constraint to run the experiment. Before, that was what we worried about. How many seconds will it take to run this on the processors I have? Now it became, well, how many weeks is it going to take me to understand what I did? 
And so we started a company called Renesis um, that initially was just going to do that. We were going to study the internet in modeling and simulation space. And uh, very quickly, it became clear that we could start to pull in some of the real world data sets, what was actually happening on the real routing table. Uh, there were sites available that would give you um, raw dumps of the BGP update traffic. You know, they would give you snapshots of the routing table, and you could go in and mine these and figure out what was going on during real events. Uh, I was stranded in, uh, in Leiden in the Netherlands during 9-11, and I remember looking that day at some of the effects of routing through New York as buildings came down and realizing this was very concrete. Right? This was how the world was really evolving, and instead of just being in modeling and simulation, we could actually see it going on. So we did this uh, for a long time. Um, in last year, we actually merged forces with Dyn, uh, as an internet performance company that uh, does uh, some of the managed DNS, the authoritative and secondary DNS for some of the most important properties on the internet. And it's uh, in that, that uh, combination that we're going to try to start to see um, some very concrete ways to reach out to people, help them do business on the internet in a way that uh, you know, is high performance and take away a lot of the mystery about how people actually get from A to B. Um, and this is the playground that I get to play on every day. This is what we built. Um, we've got virtual servers and physical servers all around the globe. We're doing live trace route measurements um, to about a million and a half curated targets every day. So we're collecting several billion measurements of round trip latencies and paths. We're putting that up against the BGP map, the, the real time map of how everything connects to everything using the border gateway protocol, which we'll show today. And so on that playground every day, there are more things to look at than there are eyeballs and, and hours to, to survey the, the things that happen. Um, so let's take a look here. I said that this was gonna be the, the motivational problem. The problem is one of attribution and belief. I give you an IP address. I say, I'm being attacked from this IP address. What kind of credibility, what sort of credence should you give that association between an IP and some kind of real world domain like a geography or a person organization? Well, the answer is not much because um, the underlying routing protocols are very, very easy to confuse. The whole thing is based on trust. That trust can be subverted. It can be subverted in ways that hide the truth from almost everybody on earth and confuse a very specific subset of people. And so the really, it's very, very hard to authoritatively say, this IP address was doing this to me at this time. You also said it's similar in there. Hmm? There could be multiple machines <laughs> pretending. <laughs> of course, there, there are actually legitimate scenarios, right, where a single IP address is supposed to be hundreds or thousands of machines. And it, it doesn't even have to be a single point on Earth. So yeah, you can think of that as uh, a purely uh, intentional form of spreading an address around the world. We're going to take a look here at some of the cases where that happens unintentionally or maliciously. So I don't know if you have a lot of familiarity with BGP itself. I will kind of gloss over, but for the, the core vocabulary is important for what follows. Um, this is the protocol that runs the internet. Um, BGP is used inside autonomous systems, organizations on the internet, but of course it's also used exclusively pretty much between autonomous systems. It's what makes networks into the intern network. Um, it is based on a couple of RFCs, which you can read at your leisure. Today, there are about 49,000, perhaps a little more, autonomous systems doing this. Each one does BGP according to its own rules so it can keep itself connected to everybody else in that graph, okay? So people have their own networks, their own assigned blocks of IP addresses. They advertise these to their, to their BGP neighbors uh, and magic happens. Everybody independently picks the best path to everything else that they might wanna reach and as that converges, based on all of those local decisions at 49,000 different autonomous systems, the whole thing meshes up and traffic goes on its way, okay? So the protocol itself is really, really simple. I've seen um, smart undergrads write this, you know, in a, in a, in a week-long project. You can write a BGP speaker that will be conformant and, uh, and, and, and to all, uh, attend, for all intents and purposes, it, it is a BGP speaker like a Cisco router. The protocol is simple, but the policy is complex because everybody gets to make their own rules. This is the rule of the internet, right? My network, my rules. Um, I can decide what I want to accept, what I want to reject, what I want to propagate, not propagate, and it's purely based on my decision. 
And so that's great because this is what allows internet routing to change with the times and to adopt different economic models, different business models, um, because we're not all locked into one firm policy worldwide. On the other hand, <laughs> this flexibility is what allows us to shoot each other in the foot, uh, which we do every day. So let's work an example, okay? This is, we're gonna start here with the autonomous system numbers. These used to be 16 bits. Um, for over five years, these have been 32-bit ints, although there's still lots and lots of routing equipment in the world that gets hopelessly confused and does not understand that you can have an AS number greater than 16 bits. It's mysterious. I mean, when you think about what it takes to upgrade the internet, you can't roll a truck and upgrade the internet. You have to persuade everybody on Earth to upgrade the internet, and they do it slowly over time. Something as simple as moving from 16 to 32-bit AS numbers takes years, and that's just a very simple change that is done for them by the equipment vendors. Um, these AS numbers are given out, of course, by the regional registries, and they were given out in order. So if you ever see an AS number in this presentation that has a small number, you'll know this is one of the early days. I won't say a dinosaur, but this is one of the the primordial autonomous systems. So Stanford got in nice and early, not quite as early as Yale, but uh, Stanford has 32, okay? As you move forward in AS number space, you start to see uh, different people starting to make money. Um, so level three comes in at 3356. Level three actually bought BBN, so they actually have AS number one, and they don't use it, which is mysterious to me. Uh, China Telecom came in in the 4,000s. Microsoft arrives around 8,000. Google doesn't show up until 15,000. They didn't even get a four-digit AS number, which is kind of shameful. And then as you go out in history, you find commercial organizations, kind of the last guys to the party, buying uh, these 32-bit AS numbers in the last couple of years. So Bank of Taiwan is up there in the 130,000s and Nomura. So here's a scenario. Okay, We're going to put some of these AS numbers to work. This is a complete scenario for a potential BGP hijacking, but I made this up. So if you know somebody, your cousin works at one of these companies, do not have them send lawyers to me, because this is fictitious. I had to pick something to go through that would make sense, but it's not real. We will look at some real examples next from history. So let's imagine, let's pick on the Nomura Group. So Nomura Group is in Tokyo, and uh, they have 197039, and they have this autonomous system number, which was assigned to them in, by RIPE in the UK. Why? Because they operate, uh, they took over somebody's failing trading floor infrastructure in the big crash of 2008. I don't remember who it was. Um, and so they, they have this autonomous system so they can operate in London. Okay. They've been given eight, no, sorry, 11 IPv4 address blocks, blocks of space that belong to them, belong in quotation marks, because theoretically you don't really own IP space, you borrow it from humanity for a given time. Um, but they have these 11 blocks, and each one of these blocks contains a certain number of unique IP addresses that only they should be using. They used to number their infrastructure right, in London. So let's pick one of these. There's 194.36.241 slash 24. So slash 24 is important because it shows you how many significant bits there are in the IP address, in the, in the prefix. That's why we call it a prefix. 24 bits leaves you eight bits at the end for numbering your machine. So you get 256 addresses for your trading floor. Okay, so far so good. Now Nomura wants to speak BGP. They wanna make sure everybody on earth can reach this slash 24 in all those machines. So they'll go out and spend some money. Nomura knows how to spend money. They'll go out and buy transit, IP transit from two different providers. And these are Nomura's actual real providers in London. Uh, one is Colt, a very good network in Europe. The other one is Verizon. Uh, notice that this is, they have a nice low AS number because 702 secretly used to be UUNet Europe, right? So this is an old inherited network. Um, they're paying money. That's what transit is, right? You're paying money to somebody for the promise of global delivery. Peering is something different. I mean, every time you establish an adjacency in BGP, it's peering, but peering is different from transit. Traditionally, peering takes place between cust customer bases. People are showing each other their customers, and they'll say, I'll give you routes to mine if you give me routes to yours, and we won't pay any money. And then everybody saves money on transit. So ideally, you'd never have to pay for transit. In point of fact, there's only maybe a dozen organizations on Earth who can say that. Everybody else still has to buy a little transit. So here's Nomura. They've bought transit from two guys. They paid some money. Colt, of course, is a European network. They can't actually take your traffic everywhere on Earth, even though that's what buying transit means. So they kind of lied. 
Well, to make that lie truth, they have to go out and lay it off. It's kind of like insurance and reinsurance. So they go ahead and they buy from Deutsche Telekom. They buy from level three. So if Nomura sends a packet to the United States, that packet goes up to Colt. Colt says, oh, right, okay, you take it level three. Level three is getting money from Colt, who's getting money from Nomura. The money goes out, the traffic comes back, and they keep everybody connected. Now, Deutsche Telekom and level three don't make as much money in this stage because this wholesale aggregation, and we're talking at this point about uh, you know, cents per megabit. It's uh, very thin as you get up into wholesale. Now we keep doing this, okay? I can't fit 49,000 ASs on the slide, so here's, you know, six or seven. It just keeps going. So everybody on Earth transitively has relationships now that reach back through the chain, the AS path to Nomura. So in case anybody on Earth, Russia, you know, uh, anybody, Siemens, wants to send traffic to the trading floor of Nomura in London, they have a way to get there. It's connected up. Most people are paying money. Some people there in the core are exchanging. They're not paying any money, but it all works out. And that's incredible. You know, this is what we kind of had a hard time believing, imagining could ever happen at, there at the mid end of the 90s, that this could scale up just based on that one relationship style to almost 50,000 ASs today. They all speak BGP to each other the same way. They've decided, you know, we looked at one prefix here, but there's over half a million of these things out there. Everybody's got a route. There's, there's maybe 20,000 IPv6 networks. We probably won't get to v V6 today. Focus on sort of the broad base of the internet, V4. But, you know, it's interesting because autonomous systems are buying transit from each other. Most have, well, 40% of them only have one, kind of degenerate. 40% have two, that's better. 20% have three or more, and that's good diversity. That's what you want to see. And so the amazing thing is that in this enormous graph, this worldwide graph, anybody on Earth can change anything. You know, oh, I've got a new route. I've got a new network. And within 30 seconds, every other router on Earth that speaks BGP that has a full table will hear about it and adjust accordingly, and the paths will all have converged. That's pretty extraordinary. You imagine that a single randomly selected path through this graph is about 5.3 hops. So there's me and the guy I'm trying to talk to and three guys in the middle who don't even have a contractual relationship with me or him necessarily, and yet it works out anyway. It's like a whisper game. Ever play the whisper game? So I send out my announcements, and of course I have to send money with my announcements to make sure that people will pay attention. Um, as I send out my announcements and my money, Traffic starts to arrive at my site, and everybody does this. It's symmetric all around the internet. Okay, so far so good. Well, okay, first moment of concern on slide 21. What happens if Nomura guy gets up in the morning and he types the wrong number into a router config and he publishes it? So if I send out a bogus route announcement, what will happen? Nothing should happen, right? your advertising space you don't legitimately sort of lay claim to. Hopefully nothing will happen. Hopefully no traffic will actually come back. In fact, it doesn't really work that way. So this guy has changed the third octet from 241 to 252, and suddenly he's squatting on space that's owned by Wedgwood UK, those people who make the beautiful china that people get in their wedding registries. And he doesn't own this space. He has no business routing this. But he's pushed it up there to Colt and Verizon. Hopefully Colt and Verizon say, well, wait a minute, you've never advertised that before. That's not even your space. You know, I'm going to filter that. I'm not going to allow you to spread that to the rest of the internet. Now, practically speaking, many, many, many service providers still do not comply with the best, co best common practice of filtering customer routes to put these illegitimate things on the side. Instead, they will happily turn around and advertise them to everybody else on Earth. And in just a few seconds, everyone on Earth will believe that Wedgwood China, this unused block of space, is legitimately hosted on the trading floor of Nomura in London. So why wouldn't they filter? Well, it's work, right? Internet transit business is pretty, uh, pretty skinny margins these days. There's not a lot of time, people, or money, which are all equivalent, to go hunting these things down and doing a really good job, as much as we, the community, would prefer it to be so. So some people set max pref, 
That's a, an attribute you can set on a session. So if somebody suddenly advertises 1,000 prefixes, they will blow through max pref, this maximum number. And that session will get torn down. Somebody will figure it out, and there will be some delay and some outage. Um, that helps with big leaks, but it doesn't help with this one leak. Sometimes people build static lists of things that their customers are allowed to do. That's a good idea. Sometimes they go to the routing registries, where people are kind of honor bound to put uh, at least some record of what they're trying to route so people can compare it against reality and say, well, wait a minute, this doesn't quite match up. So in practice, people do a really poor job of that, maintaining those registries. People try, they build automated filters from it, and this stuff still gets through, okay? What's the ballpark of how often that was happening? Uh, continuously. And Once a day or every day? Yeah, every day. Every day. Yes. Somewhere. Yes. What happens if instead of parking on an unused space, somebody parks on a used space? Excellent question. This is what happens right here. Okay. So these guys, okay, Wedgwood UK was fine. They probably didn't even notice. They weren't using that space. Seriously, they probably never would notice such a thing. But what if they changed one digit in that route that they published, and they changed it to a zero? So now, it's an early octet, which means they're, they're outside the local region where these numbers were being given out, and it's a longer distance failure. These guys have just squatted on a piece of CAN TV, which is an important access network in Venezuela. In, uh, in, and, and, and the problem here is that there are probably people using this space in Caracas. It's actively used. So what's going to happen? Well, now we have a fight. Okay, we've got two routes in the routing table. Venezuela is putting out a slash 16, great big network, to cover all of their Caracas subscribers. And Nomura just came along in this fictitious example and injected a little covering route, or a little more specific route, the slash 24. Now, the problem here is BGP likes more specifics. The protocol was designed so that you give it, it looks for the most specific route, the, the, most, uh, uh, the smallest, most direct network to those addresses it can find. And if it sees a big 16 and a small 24, it will zero in on the small 24. That's one of the mechanisms that was used for providers to give out pieces of their space as it was intended. Okay, send traffic towards the AS who actually made the most specific announcement. Well, great, that little hole that we've just punched in the slash 16, that's now going to go to London. And it's gonna happen silently. And the folks in Venezuela, unless they're using some very Sophisticated route table monitoring tools may not actually notice that anything is wrong. Uh, they may see that route pop up, and they may not have any way in the knock of knowing that it's there, because they didn't expect it to be there. What they'll actually see is a drop in traffic. So all the traffic from, that's closer to the hijacker, this is a hijack, all the traffic that was originated closer to the hijacker in BGP space is going to go to the hijacker. And all that traffic is going to fail to show up in Caracas. And that's what they're going to notice. Right? So, yeah. When you say PGP space, are you talking about number space or physical geometry? I'm actually talking about the number space. So we have this graph of the autonomous systems. And an AS path is a, a, the shortest identified path through that graph to the origin from the questioner. Um, so it's in that space, and that space does not necessarily have anything to do with physical geography, which is why this can get really strange. So, okay, this seems, you can't believe that this actually works for a planetary internet. How did we get this far with this protocol? You can do anything you want. You can say anything you want. And if nobody filters you, if nobody calls BS, it'll happen, right? There is no central or even hierarchical authority that you could consult to say, is this really a good idea? And actually, that's why we built it that way. <laughs> the founders of the internet were, had, this, had this, um, uh, this fear of centralized authority, which I think is pretty healthy, because they knew if there were a centralized registry where you could go for the authoritative word on whether you could do that, it would get captured by somebody who had some power. And because it doesn't exist, it can't be captured but it spreads the responsibility to everybody else. Okay, well that's just theoretically. Let's see some real anomalies. Okay, that was just a fictitious example. Let's take a look at how this has actually played out uh, throughout time. And let's put it in the form of a game. I like games because they're interactive. This is a simple protocol. It's being played in a complex world. Emergent phenomena take place. It can be very, very hard for experts to tell whether these are legitimate routings or 
evil routings. So you guess. I'll do five of these. Five is about as many as I can stomach. So here's number one. We get reports from a building in Singapore that uh, people on two different floors of the building, let's say floor 10 and floor 11, have different service providers. They're trying to talk to each other on the internet. And it's really slow. It takes 350 milliseconds for a packet to get from floor 10 to floor 11. They think that's pretty strange. So they go to their network folks and they say, can you run a trace route? And they trace it and they find out it's going through a mysterious data center in California. It's evil? What do you think? It's not evil. That's the way economics works. What you have here is two providers, one of which has more power in the Singapore market than the other one, and refuses to peer. He says, I'm not going to exchange traffic with you locally unless you pay me. And the other guy says, I'm, not, I'm a huge international provider. I'm not paying you. Fine. Well, you're not going to meet me in Singapore. So they go meet each other at the only other closest place they can meet each other, which is in San Jose, at one of these big buildings. And the traffic goes there and comes back. And everybody's happy because they didn't, get, they didn't uh, pay any money to somebody they didn't want to pay. And they didn't cave in and peer with somebody they religiously don't want to peer with. Um, and everything's fine, except that the traffic takes 350 milliseconds and goes across the ocean twice. Completely normal. Here's scenario two. I'm sending traffic from Germany to New York City. And I measure the traffic. And it takes about 70 milliseconds. And I do a trace route. And it goes through Iceland along the way. It goes like uh, Frankfurt, London, Iceland, Montreal, New York. Is that evil? Is that expected? Expected? Oh, it's very unusual. That sounds right, doesn't it? It sounds plausible. It almost looks like a great circle route. But um, there are lots of submarine cables that can get you from London to New York in one hop. Right? No, no reason to come ashore in Iceland. You don't have to regenerate the IP packets or something. And nobody would ever come ashore in Iceland to carry traffic between uh, Europe and the United States because it would add, actually it would add latency because it's not on the great circle route. It would add cost because there's a provider in the middle taking a cut. What actually happened here was, and this was a real incident, there was a provider in Iceland that was advertising United States space, space from all over actually, uh, in Europe, pulling the traffic to them, putting it back on the network in Montreal, and letting it go. And it should not have happened, and yet it did. We'll look at that in a little more detail in a second. Here's number three. Okay? This one's a Google example. Okay? We're measuring. So one of the ways you can tell where something is is to measure time it takes to get there. Right? Speed of light is, you can't really fool the speed of light. Things take a certain amount of time to go from A to B. So we're measuring along. How long does it take to get public DNS to answer a question from South America? It takes these, you can see the latency. The time is on the x-axis, the latency on the y. This is from South American observation points. It takes a certain amount of time until it doesn't. So suddenly in October 2013, it takes a lot longer. Okay. Normal or not? Let's just go. It's not evil, right? It's Google. It can't be evil. <laughs> <laughs> so what actually happened is this is Anycast, right? Anycast is where you announce the same thing in lots of places. I deliberately spread this IP address all over the planet. And you will rely on BGP to take you to the closest instance. Okay. So there were some political things going on. There was some internet governance issues raised in Brazil around this time. And suddenly, the Brazilian instances of public DNS uh, weren't answering anymore. And everybody had to go to California instead. That's that jump in latency. And then in February 2014, it gets sorted out. And latencies go back to where they were because Brazil starts to answer again. I don't know what that is. It's not engineering. But it's not evil. That's just economics and politics. Here's a, here's a related one. Um, so imagine that I have a domain where people are downloading really critical stuff, like software updates. And this thing takes a certain number of milliseconds, about 25 milliseconds, when I measure it um, from Eastern Europe going back to Western Europe, which is where the server lives. And one day, performance really improves. It becomes less than 5 milliseconds. <laughs> and then it goes back the way it was. Well, that was weird. What do you think? Is that evil? Yeah, that's <laughs> That was really evil because what happened, you can't fool the speed of light. If you're in Eastern Europe, you've got to get to Western Europe and you're getting it in two milliseconds. Something has gone terribly wrong. So this is what actually happened. This site 
was the IP address was something had that IP address and was answering in the immediate local neighborhood. You know, the phone calls coming from inside the house. This is that. And, and when you see that, you need, immediately start thinking, well, how wide was that pattern of disruption? And why would somebody do that? Sometimes you end up with more questions than answers. All right, last one. Last one, scenario five. Two good friends on the internet, big ASs, powerful ASs, Russian Vimpelcom, enormous carrier, and China Telecom, China's sort of biggest state telco uh, internet provider. Good friends have connection together, they're peers. Um, so Vimpelcom advertises 7,000 of customer prefixes to China Telecom, saying here, if you need to reach my Russian customers, here are the routes. And China Telecom says thank you, and announces them out the door to all of its other peers. And China Telecom says here, Vimpelcom, here are 300,000 networks I can reach on my network. Feel free to use them. And of course, traffic on that link goes way up. Wow, this is great. We're sharing so much stuff. Normal or no, it's not, not even vaguely. This is a terrible idea. I don't know if this was deliberate or accidental. But remember, if you're peering, transit says, I give you traffic. You take it where it goes. No questions asked. I paid you. Peering is we're only supposed to share our customers, right? If you re-announce peering routes to your peers, what you have done is accidentally become a transit provider for free. Um, there may be reasons to do that. I can't think of any really good ones. And this is what happened. So here's an actual trace that we ran while this was going on, tracing from Moscow to New Hampshire. And you might expect that to go right across the ocean. Instead, it goes uh, Moscow, Frankfurt, Frankfurt into China Telecom. Hey, wait, what's going on here? China Telecom takes it to Shanghai. Wait, whoa. You know, Shanghai, Los Angeles, uh, and then back across the United States. So it comes in San Jose, uh, goes through Chicago, goes to Cleveland, goes to Albany, and it's in New Hampshire. It's the wrong way around the world. Well, that's what happens if you accidentally become a transit provider. And this lasted for a long time, giving away transit. And by the by, intercepting a lot of Russian traffic that was going to places all over the world. Pretty neat. Any questions at this point, sort of on these sort of fundamental things? This is just a sampling, right? These are these sort of stories. We publish some of these on our blog. Uh, there are a lot of small fish that we catch in these nets that we just turn loose because we don't have enough time to, to examine them all. BGP hijacks. So let's take a look at just what we've actually seen. Yes? Who is in a position to monitor this stuff? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we are. Uh, thank you. It's not a placed question. Um, there, there are commercial services that you can use to allow you to monitor your own networks to make sure this stuff doesn't happen to your networks. Um, you can even use it to monitor the world if you were so inclined. Uh, and there are actually public data sets that you can mine through by yourself. And I'll identify some of them at the end of the talk in case people want to get into this game of finding anomalies, because it's, it's a rewarding game. Um, but there's nobody tasked with that job. And I've, I've talked to people at, for example, INISA, the, the people who do cybersecurity in Europe. Um, and this is, I think this is going to turn out to be a real concern. It's, you know, you've got states effectively um, manipulating the routing of other states. And, and, and at that level, it becomes a, something that, that larger people should watch, you know, not just us. It shouldn't just be the citizens on the net who, who keep an eye on this. So, what was neat in 2013 was one more wrinkle. So everything I've discussed so far is actually pretty straightforward. Okay, here's the next iteration. This is a real innovative model. Um, so again, we'll go through the pecking order. Um, so as you said, you know, if you, if you squat on space, it's not even being used. It's just rude. You shouldn't do that. But um, you're not harming anybody, really. right? You're not taking away their traffic. Um, if you exact match somebody, and you say, I know you have this, but I also have it. Well, now I've stolen all the traffic from everybody who is closer to me in autonomous system space, not geographic space. So if I'm well connected, you know, if I'm a big provider at huge internet exchanges, I may actually be able to seize a large amount of traffic from very far away places that you wouldn't expect. So that's a little ruder. Let's get ruder still. Um, I take all of your traffic, you know? <laughs> So here's YouTube in Pakistan. Well, I'll, I'll just put one out there that uh, you know, you're, I'm going to basically give you a complete denial of service on what you're addressing. How about even more? I'll take your address space 
And because I know that BGP loves more specifics, I'll break it up into bite-sized pieces and I'll advertise all of it. And if I take it out to slash 24, which is the tiniest block most people will publicly route in today's internet, you can't even get it back because you can't go to the 25 to try to outdo me in this game. You're stuck at the, most, the, the smallest block you can publicly route. All we can do is fight for it on a block by block basis. That's really evil. But it pales in comparison <laughs> to the, the man in the middle. Man in the middle is where I lie to some part of the world and I get your traffic and I do something with it. And I put it back on the internet and I make sure you get it just as if nothing had happened. That's worse than actually taking your traffic and, and not giving it to you, right? The way this actually works, and this is, you know, the other things we've talked about, the typos, the fat finger mistakes on router configs, these could all be explained away. We've had them explained away to us many times. Oh, I, I inverted two digits, you know, I uh, edit distance one, you know. Um, <laughs> this, this, you can't do this accidentally, because this has to be constructed. So what I do, I'm the hijacker here in the middle. I, I create two different routing zones around me. I partition all of my adjacencies into two sets. Let's call them clean and dirty. So on the dirty side, I lie to people. I say, I'm the victim, victim this way, come this way. And the traffic comes my way, and I have the traffic. And then I turn around to my other unaffected peers, and I say, I don't know what this is. This is going to this other guy. I, I put it back on the net, and my transit providers typically will just deliver it. And they'll, put it, they'll get it back to its intended recipient. And the intended recipient doesn't even realize anything happened because his traffic volumes didn't change. All that happened is it got a little slower. And if I pick my spot correctly, it may not even get a lot slower. Maybe even it gets faster. So this technique was first described by Tony Capella. He did a great job of this at DEF CON 16 way back in 2008. And he did this in the best possible way for the show, which was he did it to the show network. <laughs> <laughs> he took all of their traffic and he re redirected it through his own stuff by announcing more specifics, attacking the traffic, and then putting it back. And if you ran trace routes, you could see, wow, all the show traffic is now going through my server. And that was pretty scary. It got a lot of people's attention in 2008. We went back at Black Hat and did a talk in 2009 where we actually went through all the data in history since we started recording back in 2001 and said, well, the good news is this has never been seen in the wild. The only one we found was Tony and not anybody else. And so, well, that's good. Um, the attack was a subtle one. There's a thing in BGP called uh, loop detection. So if, you, if I receive a BGP update and it's already got my AS number in the path, I'm supposed to throw that away. I just throw it on the floor because I don't want loops to start happening in routing protocols, right? That's, you can imagine the sort of amplification and disaster that would result. So if I see my own AS, I say, oh, all right, I've been here before, throw that away. Well, an attacker can use that. You just put their AS in the path as you rewrite the path before you send the announcement on. And then what's happened is everybody else in the world believes you and the victim never actually gets to see any of the evidence because <laughs> all the routes that show that he's been hijacked never reach him. Um, the, 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 the subtlety ramps up from there. Okay? As you can imagine, when people really want to do something and when they're good at it, they will study all the different ways to make this happen in subtler and subtler ways. So we saw people use BGP communities, these little optional attributes you can add to announcements to make sure that the lies that you put out only propagate to certain people, that they never make it back to the victim, or in fact, they never make it back to a global scope where somebody might be watching to figure it out. We saw people try to announce only to peers, for example, right, and not transit providers, knowing that um, peering typically is more localized. So I'm trying to attract traffic from an immediate neighborhood, and then I use my transit providers as my clean path to get it back on its way. So I want to attract traffic from my local neighborhood that's headed to the victim, quick detour through my data center, back on the net, you never figure out anything else is happening. Okay? And it works really well, as I said, if you're somebody who has a lot of peering, a lot of adjacencies, you're a very well-connected guy, you can get huge amounts of traffic this way. So here's what we saw in 2013, and we put this on the Renesis blog. Um, Bell Telecom is the Belarusian incumbent provider. 
And there were lots of downstream ASs, customers of Bell Telecom, who put routes, apparently, into the table, claiming to be various other people in the world. So these were the hijacked prefixes. These were things all over, uh, all over the world, but there were a lot of them in the United States. Um, we were able, because we have this hybrid infrastructure where we're both watching the routing and we're doing trace route active monitoring, we were able to, to launch traces during these attacks and find out what routers were passed through on the way. The traces go through Bell Telecom. They don't really go through these customers who were originating it. Um, here's a, the other one we talked about was the Icelandic one, right? Here's a, a traffic graph from that time. You can see spikes in traffic. Well, yeah, they were getting spikes in traffic because they were announcing other people's prefixes in Europe. And when we ran traces through them while the attacks were going on, if they were in fact attacks, they could have been misconfigurations. Um, you could see that traces were going uh, uh, through Iceland and back into Canada and then on to the origin. And when we talked to them, they said, well, yeah, okay, you're right. We did redirect some traffic. Um, there was a, a router software bug. This was a sort of a classic thing. And uh, we fixed it. And, and they fixed it. It didn't happen again. Um, but it resulted in some really weird things. Okay, so these are a little hard to see, but let me, let me describe. So the green is the way traffic normally goes, and red is the way we saw traffic going. So we actually captured these traces live. So normally, I want to go from New York to Los Angeles. Well, <laughs> during the attack, it goes New York, London. Wait a minute, we're going the wrong way. London to Moscow, because that's how you get to Minsk. Minsk. Okay, now we go back on the clean side, back to Frankfurt, back to New York, second time in New York, and over to Los Angeles. <laughs> so, again. That, I, exactly. It has to be a typo. It couldn't, yeah, that must be a typo, yeah. Um, here's how we get from Frankfurt to Fremont, California during the Icelandic event. So normally, you know, you're going from Europe to California, you just hop across the pond, you're in New York, you're in Washington, take it across the country, San Jose, Fremont, done. During the event, uh, we, uh, we see it go all over the place. I mean, it starts in Frankfurt, goes to London, up to Reykjavik. That's the hop that should not happen. Back to Montreal, down to New York, over to San Jose, and we're done. Bizarre. Here's my favorite one, my favorite trace route out of all the hundreds of millions of traces that we processed in this experiment. I'm, this is like our Singapore example with the office building, right? I got two guys in Denver, they've got different service providers. Now, if you have different service providers, the way BGP works, okay, if they're not on best of terms locally, things may happen. So normally, in the green, you can see it goes Denver, Dallas, Kansas City, Denver. That's not terrible, right? At least it's in the right region. Um, but during this event, <laughs> The traffic starts in Denver, goes to Chicago, goes to Ashburn, Virginia, up to New York, over to London, up to Reykjavik, back to Montreal, back to Chicago, back to Ashburn again, and then back to Dallas, and finally to Denver. Okay, we've gone across town, and we've gone through Iceland. Just uh, amazing that more of these things were not discovered by users, but users in this day and age are actually fairly tolerant of higher latencies. And People may not have noticed anything was happening. So, you know, to the question, can this be fat fingering? Can it just be accidents? Um, it's very hard. We go back, we look at the archive. Remember, uh, Dyne, Renesis at this time, is recording all the BGP update traffic that we collect from over three or four hundred different sessions with providers all over the world. So we get to kind of do an instant replay back through these moments of time in routing. And we can see that there are communities being applied to these routes, specifically saying things that make sense to those peers, saying, um, I want you not to give this to your international peers. I do not want you to announce this outside of our region. Keep this local. But announce it to everybody locally, right? Because you're trying to get as many people as possible locally in the geographic region to send you the traffic. But you need the clean path, so don't announce this to anybody internationally or the jig will be up. It's very hard to do accidentally. So this happened uh, in, in 2013. We actually saw this on over 100 different days. There was something like this going on to somebody, which is rather extraordinary. Uh, thousands of networks being targeted. Uh, there were some very interesting uh, organizations whose prefixes those were, many of whom we, we've talked to and worked with to try to assess what was going on there. 
um, if you look at what sorts of things are going on in these prefixes, there's over half a million domain names, right, that are bound to IPs that are in that space that potentially were anybody to go to any of those domains, that traffic, hopefully it was all encrypted, would be intercepted by the, inter, the, the guy who interjects himself into the middle. Um, you'd think that these would be maybe, you know, hours long. Some of them are only minutes long. Some of them are very fast. Uh, we've seen people hijack things like Bitcoin servers. Or you take the address space of some guy who's giving out Bitcoin solving problems, and for a few minutes you give out problems that you'd rather have people solve that get credited to you. Right? So some of these things happen for minutes. Um, we saw some that lasted for months. And on the internet, if something lasts for months, that's kind of normal, right? That becomes the new normal. Um, it's, it's unusual in that we see people trying this and working the edges. We see them adjusting the, the strategy that they use to make sure that the poisoning happens in exactly the right way. Um, kind of disheartening. We can see some of the cities, right? You wouldn't expect this to be a pinpoint operation. People everywhere were impacted by this. There were hijacked networks all over opportunistically, right? We can look at um, what percentage of each country's uh, eyeballs, if you will, probably got fooled by this. Remember, hijacking means that you only get fooled if you're close. And in some of these, these were, not, these were broadly propagated. They were not, in fact, you know, carefully constrained. And so if the blue cities are where things were being detoured, uh, from. You can see that some of these red places on Earth are places that were in, in very high uh, exposure. That uh, many, many people there, because of the way their service providers connect to people who are close to the victim, were liable to get their traffic redirected during this time. So it's, it's truly a global problem. And it's probably just a few guys, you know, sitting there in one specific place just injecting these nets. So we made a big stink about this. We published a blog we took it to the press. The press uh, finally sat up and took a look in 2013 in the springtime and said, uh, you know, you're right. Uh, infrastructure is important. And maybe enough people had not been paying attention to the fragility of what was going on down at routing level. And so we actually got some decent mainstream media attention to the problem that, the, uh, that you could actually do these kinds of manipulations and have these global effects. Um, and BGP mischief slowed down. That's, I wish I could say that you know, we solved the problem, we, uh, we put out the fire, but uh, we, we think we may have made, maybe it slowed down a little bit, maybe for three to six months. Um, the man in the middle stuff seemed to go uh, way down. We still saw the accidents, because accidents happen independently, right? They're not intentional things. Um, but when we were running trace routes through these various hijackings, we would not see traces that go through the hijacking place and then complete, which is what we wanted to see. Um, so, but routing leaks are always going to be with you. As long as you have network engineers who are maintaining uh, routing configs, uh, Murphy's Law takes over, people will publish things that they don't own, sometimes very large piles of things. And the filtering is so poor, those effects will, will inevitably have a real impact on somebody. So the reprieve that, 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 that took place uh, lasted maybe six months, and then it came right back again. And it's been getting more and more sophisticated, more and more interesting in the last year. And we just released a blog on the Dyn research site, that's research.dyn.com, in which we detail some of the, the fraudulent routes that go on. And this thing is an enormous blog post where we, we poured about six different uh, specific incidents in there that are happening right now, that have been happening recently. Uh, all kinds of different people doing it, all kinds of different victim scenarios. Um, what drives this? Right? How are we going to fix this? The problem is that the problem of needing space on the internet is pretty primordial. We're running out of IPv4 space. Uh, it's almost all been given out now. It could be that these sorts of things are what happens when the subway car gets crowded and when the subway car gets crowded, people are going to start throwing elbows, right? You're accidentally going to be in somebody else's space. You're going to need space. You're not going to be able to get it from the registries. You're going to go hunting for some vulnerable space. You're going to take it over for your purposes if you want to send spam or host malware. If you just don't want to be attributed for the thing you're doing. Uh, this is why we think this continues to happen. Um, 
We could talk about defense. I think there's going to be a lot of great research projects on how to defend against this. But I'm not uh, confident that we're ready to go there yet because we really need to talk about attribution discovery. Okay. How do you figure out that this is happening? This is you know, the question. Is there a centralized point of monitoring for this? No. Outside of a few specific organizations that make this their job, like Dyne Research, there's not a lot of, of official word on the, uh, uh, the, the, that would allow you to arbitrarily go and figure out that this was happening. If we really wanted to shut this down, we would need everybody on the internet, all 49,000 organizations everywhere on the planet, to use a route monitoring service, right? And pay attention when the alarms go off. So that's not going to happen. I would love it if that happened. It's not going to happen. Yeah? You really need, what fraction of these 49,000 are end nodes? Um, about 40% um, are, are, are sort of stub ASs, um, which is more than you would hope. But you know, at least they're prepared to speak BGP. Uh, it's true. You would think that those would be, that was where you'd start. You'd start by having their providers filter them. Um, yeah, frankly, I would start by having everybody put their routing policies, what they think they're trying to route. What am I trying to accomplish? Write it up and put it in the IRR. That alone right, would allow people to just construct filters if people could get that right. If they can't get it right, and human nature says they're not going to get it right, then we're going to have to go use some crypto. So there are excellent protocols that have been designed by very smart folks uh, to both secure the origination. Every time I come up and I am the origin for a network, I'm going to use public key crypto and sign that thing so anybody on Earth who receives it can make sure that I'm allowed to do that or that I said I was going to. Um, turns out that that's not, not sufficient, right? Because I can simply append a legitimate origin to the end of my illegitimate path um, and I'm the bad guy in the middle of the path. Nobody looks in the middle of the path. And we've seen this start to happen. So you have to use something like BGPSEC where you have transitive encryption. So every time I receive an update, first thing I have to do is pull it open and make sure that everything is valid all the way back to the origin. Right? And you know, it's going to look something like this. I, I brought in a little bit of an overview of what BGPSEC you know, description looks like. You've got to take the update you've received. You've got to open it up. You want to make sure that the guy who sent it to you, that it's, it's properly protected. Um, and then I'm going to have to wrap it in my own layer before I pass it on to somebody else that they, in turn, can go validate that I was allowed to do that. All of it works. It's, it's deployed. Um, the problem here is that that's a lot of work. And OK, fine, we have machines to do the work, right? Well, our machines right now are barely keeping up with the scale of the internet right now. You've heard about the 512K problem where the routing table got a little too big for some le legacy equipment that fell over. So imagine now when, when BGP goes wrong, it's a very bursty protocol, right? I'm, something goes wrong on the other side of the planet. There's a cable cut. Well, now there's maybe tens of thousands of routes from all those people on the other side of that cable. And they all want right now to have BGP converge worldwide so that they get their traffic. And nobody's going to wait. Nobody's going to back off. They all want that to converge right now. That's a huge amount of BGP traffic that comes at you whenever there's been one of these big correlated failures that's affecting large amounts of end user population. So imagine now that instead of just coping with the flood of BGP updates as they arrive from that cable cut, I now have to laboriously open every one of them up and revalidate it. So there's two things that routers don't have enough of ever, uh, memory and CPU cycles. And unfortunately, crypto takes both of those. You know, everything gets bigger, because you've got to keep track of all the overhead. And you've got to deal with the processing requirements in real time of uh, validating all that stuff. Is secure BGP catching on at all? I mean, it's been around for 10, 12, 15 years now. That, that's the Nobody difference. wants it? Everybody wants it. Nobody seems to want to do it, right? Um, you're, th there are people who, have, who are trying to deploy all of these solutions, and you're kind of, you know, it's like preaching to the choir. They know they got to do it, they'll do it. The problem is you have to get a critical mass of people on Earth uh, to adopt these things. And without the critical mass, um, you know, there's no, there's no chain of authentication. If we, if we break the chain, you know, we've only got a partial insight into how this is going to work. The protocols are great. What happens if we get the Internet of Things and the number of actual nodes goes up by about two or three orders of magnitude? Well, this was, this was what the IPv6 folks, I think, worried about even back in the day. 
You know, that the routing table, a lot of IPv6 was originally designed, I think, with the current biggest fear in mind, which, you know, 10 years ago was, uh, we're going to run out of routing table space, and completely legitimate, as it turns out, uh, concern. Um, I think that, you know, IPv6 has had to fall back on a lot of the same things that result in the routing table being so large for IPv4. Everybody wants to multi-home. Everybody wants to be able to do traffic engineering with small blocks. Um, so as the Internet of Things takes off, um, you know, there's only two solutions there. We either get really big routing tables with everything being end addressable, or we fall back on something like NAT. So all of those Internet of Things, but those things aren't really first class citizens on the Internet. They don't really have a portable IP address. They're all being translated behind gateways so we can conserve the IPs that we have. So let me ask you the clean slate architecture question. If you were starting all over today, what would you do? Wow. That's the question I never, ever answer, right? Because um, by the time I were to cook it up and get it out there, it would be wrong, right? And the problem is that, that you can design protocols that will make the internet work, but you can't get them in the hands of all the people that need to have them. Uh, so I, I prefer to look at the situation almost as an economist might or a social scientist and say, we've got huge amounts of data that we can gather from the system. We can study it and find the anomalies. We can define what emergent properties there are. We can try to come up with heuristics. We can try to come up with tipping points and nudges and best practices. You know, we can reach out with social networks of network operators and try to have an impact on the places that you need to have an impact in order to get most of the benefit. But I've kind of given up on the idea that we're ever going to forklift upgrade the internet you know, to, to make it right. Does that mean that with the uh, internet of things and big data, we're sort of in a global warming situation where the, <laughs> where the tipping point is past and we're in trouble? <laughs> well, the, the drivers are um, human psychology and economics, right? We, the minute that we saw that people wanted to have their own address space, right? They weren't sufficient. I think there was some thought early in IPv6, for example, that to, to keep the lid on this situation, people need to be happy with blocks of addresses that are nicely hierarchical and given out from their provider. And the fact that people said, well, no, wait a minute, actually I get a lot of optionality out of the fact that I have my own address space. I have provider independent space that I can route. I can fire my provider. I can get six more. That flexibility is something that organizations prize. And they won't give that up without a fight. They will say, well, why do I have to be the guy who has to do whatever my provider says and I have to live inside his constraints? Um, I think, you know, if, if there, we can hope that people finally get to a point where we can have trust on the internet. <laughs> so until that day comes, what are we going to do? Well, here's what we're going to do, right? We're going to take a look at using historical data to figure out what anomalies there are and chase them down. We don't have enough people to do this, even if you bring in all the emerging markets, people who need jobs. Let's do this algorithmically, right? Let's, let's automate the finding of these anomalies. The problem is that there's a lot of false positives. And I'm going to have to hurry because we want to wrap up by 5.30. But um, here's a false positive, right? If I want to do this right, I want to do it algorithmically. OK, somebody, uh, the, the George Bush Foundation, George W. Bush Foundation announces a brand new network. And they're accidentally, perhaps, taking over a portion of AT&T's bigger network. So that goes off as an alarm bell to us. Because we don't know who the George W. Bush Foundation is, but suddenly they're routing a piece of AT&T's address space. Now, that's legitimate. Because he, this is the first US president who has his own AS, by the way. So I applaud that. But um, that's his provider. He borrowed some of their space with their permission to run this foundation. Routing accomplished, right? The, <laughs> the, but is that an alarm? No, that's a legitimate thing. But an alarming system inevitably will flag that as an anomaly, and it causes noise in the system. But you could, AT&T is big enough that you might be able to cooperate with them and have them tell you who the... That's right. Um, and hopefully there would be something you know, in, their, in their registries that would point to the fact that he had, was a legitimate customer. But if they turn that route up, one day before you see it in the registries, for example, it's still going to set off an alarm bell that somebody will have to track down. So we've worked out a whole set of these heuristics to allow us to suppress the false positives. Did you do this in the past? People do engineering things all the time, briefly, in an emergency, and then they put it away. Well, if we've seen it before, it's less likely to be an, a true anomaly today. We want to see true things that have never, ever happened. Uh, we want to suppress things that are only seen by a few peers. 
We want to suppress things that are known anycast infrastructure. We talked about anycast before, right? There's root servers and, and uh, 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 DNS servers and things that are supposed to be everywhere. They're supposed to be spread around the world. So if you see 151st person start originating that prefix, you just ignore it. Well, it's just another instance of F root. Um, we have to track the organizations behind all the autonomous systems. So level three probably has, I don't know, dozens, maybe hundreds of AS numbers that they can lay some claim to because they've grown through mergers and acquisitions. So if I see um, Williams Telecom, uh, just to use a fake example, originate a prefix that belongs to level three, that's less likely to be anomalous because they have an economic relationship. Good luck putting that in an automated filter, but that's what you need to do. Um, there are services like Prolexic that get in the way of, uh, of, of traffic in order to scrub and filter. That's a legitimate commercial function. It's not a hijack. And of course, we do the edit distance things, uh, digit reversals and so forth, to w filter out the things that are, are clearly just accidents. How, how do you mind the social network or the uh, technical uh, news system to get the business relationships in an automated fashion? Um, so we built up a database over time of what we call cluster edges in the big AS graph. Um, and it, routing helps because you will typically see somebody's partner organizations downstream of them in the routing or at least doing some peering. And uh, we have a special relationship tag on those that says these two guys are exchanging traffic. It looks like peering. It looks like transit. But really it's uh, route to self. You know, so same guy. So you're, doing, you're basically traffic analysis. Uh, it's, in, in some sense, uh, we, 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 um, we will take anomalies that rise to the level of needing human attention and we'll actually go and look on Twitter, we'll go and look you know, in the news, find out is there an, some merger and acquisition activity going on. And you'd, it's... The, Can you trade on the basis of Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are things that you can potentially trade on in this data. If I tell you what they are, then they will cease to have value, so I can't tell you what they are. Now, as a specific example, we looked at, um, we were watching the routing of prefixes across the Caucasus during the Georgian-Russian War, because we knew that a lot of the fiber there travels along the oil pipeline. And that pipeline was the target of cruise missile attacks by the Russians, and we knew that if we saw a large number of Transcaucasus routes be withdrawn from the BGP routing table, it was going to be a sign that the pipeline was disrupted. You know, someday it might be possible for somebody smart to go and, and trade on information like that, but it tends to be very sporadic. Your example of multiple servers and ignoring ones that pop up, yeah. that, that will throw away the, the, the real positives. Yes, it, it may. But it's sort, of a, it's sort of a Bayesian thing, right? If, if, if there are 150 instances of having spread that, because it has a role to play being spread, then seeing one more instance of it should have a lower suspicion value than if there has always been only one copy of this network, and today, for the first time ever, there are two. Yeah, yeah but presumably it's more interesting traffic than, than <laughs> oh, could be, some you know. stuff. Oh, it's an unofficial copy of a root server, maybe. Yeah. So you talked about time in terms of uh, latency. What about time of day? Do you see anomalies in time of day? Um, we do. We looked at what time these things started and stopped, because one of the ways you can try to figure out where the people sitting in the chair are is what time of day they start and stop. Uh, and they do correlate to European sorts of working day times for the ones that we were describing. So, um, I guess, you know, you say, you know, let's make sure we're not throwing away the good stuff. So, trust me, that even after applying all of these filters, you end up with large piles of potentially anomalous stuff. And you want to then rank them according to which ones are the most unusual, right? So that you give them your attention. So we use things like geographic distance, which shouldn't make sense on the internet, but you know, still, we're humans. This is a human internet. Uh, so we look, is the hijacking AS on the other side of the planet? I mean, if it were two countries right next to each other, potentially that's a new business relationship. Maybe that's, you know, okay, Kyrgyzstan is offering some transit to Tajikistan, because they can. Um, just because it's novel doesn't mean it's wrong. But, you know, if it, the origination is in Kyrgyzstan and the original network is in Miami, you know, you worry more about it. Uh, we look at what's hosted in those domains. So now that, we're, now that we're DNS savvy, having merged in with Dyn, 
to take a look at what the networks are being used for. What's hosted there? Is it Bitcoin? Is it mail servers? Uh, you know, why would somebody want that space? And if there's something good there, it's more suspicious. Um, we, we do the, the trace based stuff, again, passing through. Does it terminate? Is it impersonation or is it man in the middle? And, and, and on and on. And we, we generate these things. We get an internal stream of these uh, automated reports. And most of them, even after all that filtering, are still not attacks. They're still not problems. But you know, we get automated attacks like this one. So this was from the Bell Telecom sequence. Um, where we're finding out the prefix, we automatically get the autonomous system ownership, we get the geography for it. We know how many of our BGP peers, how many of our reporting sensors around the world, got a sniff of that wrong routing or anomalous routing. We know how long it stayed in the routing table. It's different, right? It can be different if people are playing games with visibility. We know, in this case, it was an, an average of of you know, a little over an hour. We know which prefix it has punched a hole in. We know what autonomous system that is. We know where that thing normally lives. And based on that automated result, somebody uh, uh, will have to go and take a look. So the problem, you know, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm proposing research directions for people, I guess that's probably one of the things that we should think about here. Um, this is a global measurement problem. If you just go partner with one service provider and convince them to give you a BGP feed, you will not see enough to get a sense of the elephant that's in this room. Um, you, this, any single enterprise, any single business that's trying to defend its back end, trying to defend its services, is not going to be able to defend itself from its own perimeter. It's going to take global partnerships to get out there and look over the horizon and see what you look like from everywhere else on Earth that's not you. Because you're going to be the last person to see these things when they happen. Okay, so we have to have the, the global network in order not to miss anything. We don't want false negatives. And we're going to want multiple independent data sources, BGP and ICMP traceroute, um, BGP and DNS records, in order to figure out uh, which things are truly uh, anomalous. Right, so that we minimize false positives. Yeah. Can you create your own external thing to look at yourself? You could. So what that would be like, I suppose, would be, so if I talk to a bank, right? A bank that wanted to know what its own routes looked like around the world could go out to, for example, looking glasses that are operated by service providers, uh, often for free, kind of a throwback to the old days. And they could go in uh, manually and look themselves up and see what routes were available to them from providers around the world. Uh, it would be a manual process, and it would have to be done you know, with a frequency. Well, what frequency do you choose? We know that these attacks can go on for months. So you know, if, you, if you get caught and you've been in an attack that lasted for months, that's pretty embarrassing. But a lot of these attacks last for minutes or seconds. Yeah, why can't you automate um, A lot of the looking glasses don't support uh, automated scraping, although it doesn't stop people from scraping them. Um, the, the correct way to do it, I suppose, would be to go out and do what we do, which is to talk to the service providers around the world and say, can you please add us, the Dyne Research Organization, as one additional adjacency so that we can keep an eye on what the whole internet looks like from your perspective. And uh, I'll show you at the end some of the other data sets that you could go to for this that are not us. Um, but it's hard. You have to find a large number of people, and they have to have broad perspectives. Uh, there's a lot of providers that will say, absolutely, and then they'll give you just their customer routes. And you'll say, well, customer routes doesn't really help me here because I'm, I'm not your customer. Actually, that's the basic argument is why would that service provider give me the time of day, right? If he answers the phone for me, he's lost money. So. Um, a bank would have to go out and probably bribe people to, to give them this data. And it's the sort of thing that uh, aggregates up very nicely. There can be a few, a few people on Earth like Dyne Research that will, will do it for everybody in some sense. Um, and there are, in, there are uh, academic research projects that are doing that for everybody in some sense. Um, and you know, this is the bank. There's, here's the bank. The bank, and from dealing with, with enterprises, typically running the internet is not their job. <laughs> Surprisingly enough, they, they regard that as a cost center. And they don't often understand exactly what they're trying to accomplish in terms of routing anyway. So they don't have the ground truth to give you to create the ground truth for monitoring. 
So we actually end up having to back into that by watching what they've been trying to do for years and sort of rolling it up and presenting it and saying, it looks like this is what you're trying to accomplish. Is this basically right? And most organizations can look at that and say, wow, we still have an operation in Cleveland. I, I thought we shut that network down. But you know, eventually it will converge. Uh, and then you, you take that as the, as the alarm configuration. You say, good, all right, from this moment forward, you will receive BGP alarms uh, when this truth changes. And for a lot of organizations, that's gonna be sufficient because they don't change routing a lot of the time, these guys who are at the edge of the internet. So, they should. Yes, they do. They pay money to their service providers. And 10 years ago, 15 years ago, service providers gave you a lot more bang for your buck. You know, you could get a lot more sort of highly managed services in exchange for buying transit from somebody. But, you know, those were the days where if I bought a large circuit, I might pay hundreds of dollars per megabit, thousands of dollars per megabit, you know, depending on the technology and the geography. These days in a major market, Western Europe, North America, you're lucky to pay, I'm going to say, you know, tens of cents per megabit. And at those rates, there's just not a lot of extra money left over for people to do a lot of sophisticated monitoring. Now, a lot of service providers have turned around and said, um, fine, we will offer additional managed services on top of that. And that's probably a good differentiator. If an organization cares about that, ask your service providers and find out which of them uh, have this sort of uh, willingness to, to, to do a visibility service, to do some alarming on your behalf, because they are in a better position as the aggregator to make it work. Are charging many, many magnitudes yes. more than what we're talking about. For example, there's an optical link from London to Tokyo, um, and of course you have to buy capacity on all these spaces. But right. do those people offer any any capability to help? Um, typically, these days, when people ch get to charge more on particular routes, it's because that route has something in its favor. It's typically not, you know, better service. It's typically reduced latency, exactly. first and foremost, or the ability to reserve a lot of bandwidth if you need a lot of bandwidth. So if, if, if I operate the, 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 the trans-Siberian routes, the terrestrial routes that go across Russia that allow you to avoid the submarine cables that go from Europe to China, they charge a healthy premium over submarine cable connectivity for those routes. I don't think the customer service is going to be any better. It's just that they can charge more because there isn't as much of it, you know. Links tend, for example, the one from, from London to Tokyo is used only for financial transactions. That's right. And so, so, I mean, they're very specific markets. Absolutely. There's always going to be somebody who will pay that premium for, you know, shaving off milliseconds or putting it in microwaves to save you know, the, the propagation delay of light and fiber, even, on some routes. Uh, people are going, you know, Arctic fiber is going across the North Pole to shave off milliseconds between Tokyo and London, which is amazing. Yeah. But... Uh, the thought of managed services and security and vigilance and stuff uh, is, is, is not a part of the picture as often as it could be as an additional thing you pay for. Yes? Probably the best people in the world to observe this, because they have the most observation points, is the Five Eyes. Was there anything in the Snowden dump about this? Not that I know of. Um, so have you guys found a mark? Found a mark for this information? Uh, yeah, actually, there's a, we sell, a, well, there shall be no commercial content in a, in a symposium no, presentation. <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, very good. Um, so, Internet uh, IP Transit Intelligence is a product we do right now, where all of the, in, the commercial relationships among all of the service providers on Earth in each region are laid bare. And the market for that tends to be enterprises, but also the service providers themselves. We're trying to figure out how to make money in this, in this environment of tightening margins by understanding competition better. And that's what we do for them. Um, but route hijacking, you know, our, our new product, uh, Dyn Internet Intelligence, does have a route hijacking component because people keep asking for it because this, can, this really can happen to you. It probably will never go away worldwide, I think, unless, you know, we all commit to watching carefully. Uh, it would be great to have more research eyes on this. If students are looking for projects, um, there are data sets you can go for free and get your feet wet on this modeling challenge. 
Um, CAIDA, of course, uh, has lots of data. Measurement Lab has very good stuff, all of which is open. Oregon Route Views has a historical repository of BGP updates and uh, routing tables that goes back a long way, free for the taking. Uh, Ripe RIS over in, in Europe, equivalently good data set. These all have their problems. I will let you go find them out you know, as you crawl through the data sets and you, you find their limitations. Um, but you, know, you can't beat the price. So, um, and finally, if anybody out there is watching and wants to figure out how to break into internet measurement, the one thing I would ask is that you take your great ideas and go to these conferences. So go to NANOG, which is the North American Network Operators Group. It's right here in San Francisco in June. Uh, go to RIPE in, in Amsterdam in May. You know, if you need a reason to go to Amsterdam in May, you shouldn't need a reason to go. It's just incredible. Um, go to these conferences. Meet the people who do this for a living. Hear their war stories. Buy them refreshments. It pays back because every great idea that you probably have in internet measurement or how to improve the internet, they've heard them all. And uh, it would be great to have some, some framing context, I think, for some of the research that goes on. Because uh, these guys, you know, these are the guys who carry the pagers in the middle of the night to keep the internet flowing. And with that, uh, I think we've run right out of time. So thanks.